In all the hurry and hustle and confusion of modern living, the Lord has a way. We believe that the Bible is God's revelation of His way. We invite you to join us for In Search of the Lord's Way with Mac Lyon. Welcome, my friend, to our program devoted to a study of the Bible, In Search of the Lord's Way. In the 25th Psalm, King David prayed, Show me thy ways, O Lord, teach me thy paths. Lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. Well, that's an appropriate prayer for the child of God always, and especially in a time and culture of change. Right along with that thought, some hymn books have a song that asks, Who will follow Jesus standing for the right, holding up his banner in the thickest fight, listening for his orders, ready to obey, who will follow Jesus serving him today? Then the chorus says, Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I'm on the Lord's side. Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I'm on the Lord's side. Master, here am I. Our message today is titled, Who Will Follow Jesus? Ken Heltbrand will lead us in a hymn, then I'll be back for Bible reading and prayer. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28, 29, and 30. Jesus said, <clears throat> Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Now with the reading of those words from my Master, let us go to God in prayer. Our loving Father in heaven, we're come to you in the name of Jesus Christ with the petitions and thanksgiving of our hearts today, thankful for the privilege of being able to do so. We're thankful, Father, for the invitation that Jesus gave us to come and follow Him, be His disciples. And we pray that through the study of Your Word that we'll be able to become faithful disciples following Him always. Bless our study to, together today. May we be blessed also with Your presence. And for those who have special burdens today, we offer a special prayer in the lovely name of the Savior. Amen.
airplane, airplane recently, I, I was seated next to a gentleman who at one time had been a member of the Church of Christ. His parents were before him. His father still serves as an elder in one of the congregations in the state where they both live. He's a graduate of one of our church-related universities, and while he wasn't boastful at all about it, it was obvious he was doing quite well in business, and he enjoyed a good living. But despite the fact that his heart is still in the church, he said, and expressed a desire to be back, he had left us because, he said, we had not been progressive enough to move along with and accept the changes of a changing culture. It was his thinking that no group can survive nowadays that, uh, not to mention to grow, who will not sanction such things as divorce and, well, he mentioned a number of other things, which he said, people are just going to do anyway. I don't remember what they were, perhaps abortion and some other things. He joined another religious group, but his heart was still with us. If only we could be more flexible and progressive. Well, there's lots of debate in just about all religious groups over just how far the church can stretch itself to accommodate the culture that's so openly defiant of the faith and morals set forth in the sacred scriptures. Members of the Roman Catholic Church, the Disciples of Christ, Southern Baptist, Presbyterian, Episcopal, Lutheran, Reformed, and many other such groups are familiar with what I'm talking about. You've probably read some of it in the newspapers and, and certainly in the religious press. Some churches have experienced even open divisions. So I'm not talking about our problem alone. This message is a discussion of a very real situation experienced by a lot of us. A current trend or condition confronting all of us who profess to believe in God and Christ and who want to follow the teachings of the Word of God. In my memory, which spans more than a half century, believers have never felt the coercive force we now experience to conform to the dictates of an unbelieving social order or to be politically correct. I know it must be extremely difficult for people who do not share our faith to understand why some of us believe the Bible is the inspired Word of God and why we're so strongly committed to following its teachings to the very best of our comprehension and ability. Nevertheless, that's the way it is. That isn't legalism. It's what Jesus himself calls discipleship. To those Jews which believed on him, he said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8, verses 23 and 24. Well, the question is that of the old hymn, Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply, I am on the Lord's side. Master, here am I. That's our faith, and that's our commitment. To demonstrate how this faith and commitment relate to the current situation, <clears throat> we'll use two examples. The first relates to a matter of our faith and the other to morals. One of the strongest movements in our present culture is the women's movement. There's no one, and I repeat, no one who has done more to give women the place of respect and dignity that's due them than Jesus Christ. There's no document that has elevated women as highly and loftily as the Bible, the Word of God. Any interpretation of the Scriptures to the contrary is a perverted one and needs to be restudied. If you don't think that's true, you need to live a decade or two in a society where Christ and the Bible have not been taught and respected as they have been here in America until only recently. That woman is man's equal in God's sight is clearly stated in Galatians chapter 3, verses 26, 27, 28. For you are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Having unequivocally established the equality of the man and the woman, it needs to be pointed out that it's the Holy Spirit who writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, 
I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Now, those are divinely given relationships which when ignored or rejected by a society, well, the results will be a whole lot of problems we're experiencing today. Who will follow Jesus? The Lord's way in the home, for example, is that the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Ephesians 5, verse 23. Then verse 24 continues, Therefore, as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And the next verse says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now those are the Lord's teachings. Who will follow Jesus? In the New Testament, the leadership roles in the church are given to the men from among all his disciples, many of whom were faithful women whose names you could call and many of whose names Luke did record in the book that bears his name, chapter 8, verses 1 to 4, the Son of God chose 12 men to be his apostles. When the Holy Spirit was directing the organization of the first congregations, he specifically said, a bishop then must be the husband of one wife. It isn't that women are incapable or unequal. It's a simple matter of the relationships and responsibilities that the Lord established. According to the New Testament, the woman's role in the church is always one of submission. 1 Timothy 2, verses 8 to 15, 1 Corinthians 14, 34, and other passages. The humanist feminist movement rejects all of that and demands that the church reject it too. Who will follow Jesus? And who will follow the coercive demands of a militantly unbelieving cultural crusade to completely separate itself from the Christ way? Well, our second illustration has to do with morals. In fact, it's one of the most controversial moral issues of the day the question of homosexuality. And the reason it's so controversial is that having been given the status of special interest group, this operation is seeking to force, with the use of all means at its disposal, acceptance of that lifestyle upon every segment of our society, even on the church. Well, as in any case where you have an irresistible force that collides with an immovable object, the results are devastating. The Bible gives homosexuality a special mention in almost every catalog of sins that's in it, and it's included not by specific mention even in the others. For example, in Romans chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, these verses say, of those who have forsaken God, that God has given them up unto vile affections. For even the women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men working that which is unseemly, indecent in the modern versions, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet or due them according to most of the modern versions. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 to 11, we read the words of the Holy Spirit again. Know ye not that the, righteous, the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, now there you have the illicit heterosexual activity, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, the homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. So here the homosexual is mentioned along with other transgressors who the passage says shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven. It's interesting though that the next verse says, and such were some of you. But 
you're washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. These people were like the men, two men, the one who called me and the other who wrote me in just the last few days, who upon learning that what I'm saying is true, have chosen to turn from that behavioral pattern and are now living for Christ. Therefore, since God holds a person accountable for homosexual behavior and some of them ceased to live that lifestyle and became Christians and others still can and do, to people who believe the Bible, homosexuality is not an illness nor an inherited personality trait due to a unique brain structure, but a chosen sexual orientation that is sin. Those of you who come to hear me in whatever town or city in the nation I happen to be preaching know that in my preaching, this sin is given the same treatment as illicit heterosexual relationships. Pornography, drunkenness, divorce, murder, abortion, euthanasia, gambling, drunkenness, dishonesty, and all the other things that plague our society. Even the loosest interpretation of the Scriptures will not give legitimacy or correctness to that kind of of lifestyle. God loves sinners, including the homosexuals, lesbians, liars, murderers, thieves, fornicators, all the rest of us. Jesus Christ died to save all kinds of sinners, and we love sinners. That's what we're doing here in these broadcasts, sharing the Lord's way with people who are looking for a better way. But everyone whatever his sin may be, must turn from it in repentance and seek God's pardon in teaching with the, in harmony with the teaching of the Scriptures by baptism into Christ, being then and there washed from every and any sin in the life by the blood of Jesus Christ, and then coming forth from the grave of water to live the new Christian life and Though the urge of the temptation to continue in sin is still great after baptism, God gives the repentant sinner sufficient strength to resist it and to overcome it. Well, of course, some will not do that. They take another course. They choose rather to force acceptance of their morality or their immorality or their lifestyle on every segment of society even on the religious segment, whether by insinuation or by intimidation or by legislation. But the church gets its orders from Jesus Christ, who while He loves sinners, hates sin, Hebrews 1, 9, His is a kingdom of righteousness, Romans 10, 17. His scepter is a scepter of righteousness, Hebrews 1, 8. Oh, of course, there are homosexuals in the churches just as there are in the military and everywhere else. Some practicing, some repentant. But the sin must not. It just must not be given spiritual or social sanction any more than illicit heterosexual sin or murder or divorce for every cause. The question comes again, who will follow Jesus? Father, we thank you for your teachings in the Word, the superior way of life that they reveal to us. We pray that meditation on this subject today will be profitable to us all. In the lovely name of Christ we pray. Amen.
just a moment, I want to go back to the idea that uh, for the Christian religion to survive, it must be more progressive and flexible enough to accept the cultural demands of the 90s. In half a century in the churches of Christ, I've never been part of a congregation that wasn't growing. I'm a member of a church that's growing right now. This television and radio ministry is a fast-growing thing. And one of our stated purposes from the beginning, and in sustaining it too, is to present the Lord's way as a viable alternative to the sinful, disobedient, dissident lifestyles of the current culture. Of course, we'd like for everyone to accept our message, but we know it won't be any more than didn't everyone accept Christ Himself. But surely you will follow Him, won't you? You know, the ten lost tribes of Israel were not lost because they were so different from their culture that they were ostracized and died, but because they just blended in with the culture so that they were never again distinguishable or identifiable. In Ephesians 5, verses 11 to 14, the Lord says to Christians that they're to have nothing to do with the worthless works of darkness, but rather expose and reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made visible by the light, because it's light that makes them visible. That's why he says, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Light is, a, is precious because it dispels darkness. But if the light becomes darkness, how great is the darkness? The Lord doesn't command us to be popular, but He does require us to be faithful. They rejected Him too, remember? He said they rejected Him because their deeds were evil, John 3, 19. It isn't the church's mission to, con mission to conform to the world, but rather to preach Christ to the world. Christianity's strength lies not in being politically correct, but biblically correct. The strength of the Lord's people has never been in their number, but in their God. Only ten righteous souls could have saved Sodom if they could have been found. Genesis 19. A youth by the name of David with only a sling and a small stone saved an army of Israel. Gideon's army of only 300 soldiers defeated the mighty hordes of the Midianites. One godly woman whose name was Esther, is credited with saving the entire nation of the Jews. Almost 2,000 years ago, the lowly carpenter, itinerant preacher from Nazareth of Galilee launched Christianity with only 12 poor, unknown, uneducated social rejects. Many people said, why, it couldn't survive. And they're still saying it. But it did, and it has, and it still lives and the world is better because it lives. Christ's way never did anything but good to anybody. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply, I'm on the Lord's side? Remember Jesus said, Come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn to me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. Ye shall find rest unto your soul, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. The Lord's not putting a greater burden on us. He's relieving us of the burden that we bear already. That's the idea. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply, I'm on the Lord's side? Well, I pray you've been blessed by today's program so that you'll stand solidly against the inroads of an unbelieving culture that would force itself upon the church. If you'd like an audio cassette tape, or a printed copy of today's program titled, Who Will Follow Jesus? Simply write us, In Search of the Lord's Way, Post Office Box 371, Edmond, Oklahoma, 73083. That's In Search of the Lord's Way, Post Office Box 371, Edmond, Oklahoma, 73083. Now, you don't need to send money. It's free. The program and all our study materials and everything we do for people made available to you without any hassling for, of you for, for your money but they're your friends in Churches of Christ, and they'd like to have you worship with them as well. These are the people who make all of this possible without cost. Would you worship with a congregation that's near you there? And if you need to have some assistance in finding a church that believes in faith and in morals, doing the will of the Lord, then uh, 
you may want to write us or call us, and we'll help you find that congregation if we possibly can at all. If there's one near you, do worship with them. Thanks for being with us, and we hope you do it again next week in the hope that during the week that you may invite a friend of yours to uh, see the program next time too. Till then, God bless you and keep you. We love you.